Chapter 5 of the Interesting Narrative of the Life of Olauda Equiano. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Carl Manchester, 2007. The Interesting Narrative of the Life of Olauda Equiano by Olauda Equiano. Chapter 5 The Author's Reflections on His Situation Is Deceived by a Promise of Being Delivered his despair at sailing for the West Indies, arrives at Montserrat, where he is sold to Mr. King, various interesting instances of oppression, cruelty and extortion which the author saw practised upon the slaves in the West Indies during his captivity from the year 1763 to 1766. Address on it to the planters. Thus, at the moment I expected all my toils to end, I was plunged, as I supposed, in a new slavery in comparison of which all my service hitherto had been perfect freedom, and whose horrors, always present to my mind, now rushed on it with tenfold aggravation. I wept very bitterly for some time, and began to think that I must have done something to displease the Lord, for he thus punished me so severely. This filled me with painful reflections on my past conduct. I recollected that on the morning of our arrival at Deptford I had rashly sworn that as soon as we reached London, I would spend the day in rambling and sport. My conscience smote me for this unguarded expression. I felt that the Lord was able to disappoint me in all things, and immediately considered my present situation as a judgment of heaven on account of my presumption in swearing. I therefore, with contrition of heart, acknowledged my transgression to God, and poured out my soul before him with unfeigned repentance. And with earnest supplications I besought him not to abandon me in my distress, nor cast me from his mercy for ever. In a little time my grief, spent with its own violence, began to subside, and after the first confusion of my thoughts was over, I reflected with more calmness on my present condition. I considered that trials and disappointments are sometimes for our good, and I thought God might perhaps have permitted this in order to teach me wisdom and resignation. For he had hitherto shadowed me with the wings of his mercy, and by his invisible but powerful hand brought me the way I knew not. These reflections gave me a little comfort, and I rose at last from the deck with dejection and sorrow in my countenance, yet mixed with some faint hope that the Lord would appear for my deliverance. Soon afterwards, as my new master was going ashore, he called me to him, and told me to behave myself well, and do the business of the ship the same as any of the rest of the boys, and that I should fare the better for it, but I made him no answer. I was then asked if I could swim, and I said no. However, I was made to go under the deck, and was well watched. The next tide the ship got under way, and soon after arrived at the mother bank, Portsmouth, where she waited for a few days for some of the West India convoy. While I was here, I tried every means I could devise amongst the people of the ship to get me a boat from the shore, as there was none suffered to come alongside of the ship, and their own, whenever it was used, was hoisted in again immediately. A sailor on board took a guinea from me, on pretence of getting me a boat, and promised me, time after time, that it was hourly to come off. When he had the watch upon deck, I watched also, and looked long enough, but all in vain. I could never see either the boat or my guinea again, and what I thought was still the worst of all, the fellow gave information, as I afterwards found, all the while to the mates, of my intention to go off, if I could in any way do it, but, rogue-like, he never told them he had got a guinea from me to procure my escape. However, after we had sailed, and his trick was made known to the ship's crew, I had some satisfaction in seeing him detested and despised by them all for his behaviour to me. I was still in hopes that my old shipmates would not forget their promise to come for me to Portsmouth, and indeed, at last, but not till the day before we sailed, some of them did come there, and sent me off some oranges, and other tokens of their regard. They also sent me word they would come off to me themselves the next day or the day after, and a lady also, who lived in Gosport, wrote to me that she would come and take me out of the ship at the same time. This lady had been once very intimate with my former master. I used to sell and take care of a great deal of property for her in different ships, and in return she always showed great friendship for me, and used to tell my master that she would take me away to live with her, 
but unfortunately for me a disagreement soon afterwards took place between them, and she was succeeded in my master's good graces by another lady, who appeared sole mistress of the Etna, and mostly lodged on board. I was not so great a favourite with this lady as with the former. She had conceived a pique against me on some occasion when she was on board, and she did not fail to instigate my master to treat me in the manner he did. Footnote. Thus was I sacrificed to the envy and resentment of this woman, for knowing that the lady whom she had succeeded in my master's good graces designed to take me into her service, which, had I once got on shore, she would not have been able to prevent. She felt her pride alarmed at the superiority of her rival in being attended by a black servant. It was not less to prevent this than to be revenged on me, that she caused the captain to treat me thus cruelly. End footnote. However, the next morning, the 30th of December, the wind being brisk and easterly, the Oaelus frigate, which was to escort the convoy, made a signal for sailing. All the ships then got up their anchors, and, before any of my friends had an opportunity to come off to my relief, to my inexpressible anguish, our ship had got under way. What tumultuous emotions agitated my soul when the convoy got under sail, and I a prisoner on board, now without hope. I kept my swimming eyes upon the land in a state of unutterable grief, not knowing what to do, and despairing how to help myself. While my mind was in this situation, the fleet sailed on, and in one day's time I lost sight of the wished-for land. In the first expressions of my grief I reproached my fate, and wished I had never been born. I was ready to curse the tide that bore us, the gale that wafted my prison, and even the ship that conducted us, and I called on death to relieve me from the horrors I felt and dreaded, that I might be in that place, quote, where slaves are free and men oppress no more. Fool that I was, inured so long to pain, to trust to hope or dream of joy again, now dragged once more beyond the western main, to groan beneath some dastard planter's chain, where my poor countrymen in bondage wait the long enfranchisement of lingering fate, hard lingering fate, while ere the dawn of day, roused by the lash, they go their cheerless way, and as their souls with shame and anguish burn, salute with groans and welcome morn's return, and chiding every hour the slow-paced sun, pursue their toils till all his race is run. No eye to mark their sufferings with a tear, no friend to comfort, and no hope to cheer. Then, like the dull, unpitied brutes repair to stalls as wretched and as coarse a fare. Thank heaven one day of misery was o'er, then sink to sleep and wish to wake no more. End quote. Footnote. The Dying Negro, a poem originally published in 1773. Perhaps it may not be deemed impertinent here to add that this elegant and pathetic little poem was occasioned, as appears by the advertisement prefixed to it, by the following incident. Quote, a black who, a few days before, had ran away from his master and got himself christened, with intent to marry a white woman his fellow-servant, being taken and sent on board a ship in the Thames, took an opportunity of shooting himself through the head. End quote. End footnote. The turbulence of my emotions, however naturally, gave way to calmer thoughts, and I soon perceived what fate had decreed no mortal on earth could prevent. The convoy sailed on without any accident, with a pleasant gale and smooth sea, for six weeks till February, when one morning the Oaelus ran down a brig, one of the convoy, and she instantly went down and was engulfed in the dark recesses of the ocean. The convoy was immediately thrown into great confusion till it was daylight, and the Oaelus was illumined with lights to prevent any farther mischief. On the 13th of February, 1763, from the masthead, we descried our destined island Montserrat, and soon after I beheld those, quote, regions of sorrow, doleful shades, where peace and rest can rarely dwell. Hope never comes that comes to all, but torture, without end, still urges. End quote. At the sight of this land of bondage, a fresh horror ran through all my frame, and chilled me to the heart. My former slavery now rose in dreadful review to my mind, 
and displayed nothing but misery, stripes, and chains, and in the first paroxysm of my grief I called upon God's thunder and his avenging power to direct the stroke of death to me, rather than permit me to become a slave and be sold from lord to lord. In this state of my mind our ship came to an anchor, and soon after discharged her cargo. I now knew what it was to work hard, and I was made to help to unload and load the ship, and to comfort me in my distress in that time, two of the sailors robbed me of all my money, and ran away from the ship. I had been so long used to an European climate, that at first I felt the scorching West India sun very painfully, while the dashing surf would toss the boat and the people in it frequently above high water mark. Sometimes our limbs were broken with this, or even attended with instant death, and I was day by day mangled and torn. About the middle of May, when the ship had got ready to sail for England, I all the time believing that fate's blackest clouds were gathering over my head, and expecting their bursting would mix me with the dead, Captain Doran sent for me ashore one morning, and I was told by the messenger that my fate was then determined. With fluttering steps and trembling heart I came to the captain, and found him with one Mr. Robert King, a Quaker, and the first merchant in the place. The captain then told me my former master had sent me there to be sold, but that he had desired him to get me the best master he could, as he told him I was a very deserving boy, which Captain Doran said he found to be true, and if he were to stay in the West Indies he would be glad to keep me himself, but he could not venture to take me to London, for he was very sure that when I came there I would leave him. I at that instant burst out a-crying, and begged much of him to take me to England with him but all to no purpose. He told me that he had got the very best master in the whole island, with whom I should be as happy as if I were in England, and for that reason he chose to let him have me, though he could sell me to his own brother-in-law for a great deal more money than he got from this gentleman. Mr. King, my new master, then made a reply, and said the reason he had bought me was on account of my good character, and, as he had not the least doubt of my good behaviour, I should be very well off with him. He also told me he did not live in the West Indies, but at Philadelphia, where he was going soon, and, as I understood something of the rules of arithmetic, when we got there he would put me to school, and fit me for a clerk. This conversation relieved my mind a little, and I left those gentlemen considerably more at ease in myself than when I came to them, and I was very grateful to Captain Doran, and even to my old master, for the character they had given me a character which I afterwards found of infinite service to me. I went on board again, and took leave of all my shipmates, and the next day the ship sailed. When she weighed anchor, I went to the waterside, and looked at her with a very wishful and aching heart, and followed her with my eyes and tears, until she was totally out of sight. I was so bowed down with grief, that I could not hold up my head for many months, and if my new master had not been kind to me, I believe I should have died under it at last. And indeed I soon found that he fully deserved the good character which Captain Doran had given me of him, for he possessed a most amiable disposition and temper, and was very charitable and humane. If any of his slaves behaved amiss, he did not beat or use them ill, but parted with them. This made them afraid of disobliging him, and as he treated his slaves better than any other man on the island, so he was better and more faithfully served by them in return. By his kind treatment, I did at last endeavour to compose myself, and with fortitude, though moneyless, determined to face whatever fate had decreed for me. Mr. King soon asked me what I could do, and at the same time said he did not mean to treat me as a common slave. I told him I knew something of seamanship, and could shave and dress hair pretty well and I could refine wines, which I had learnt on shipboard, where I had often done it, and that I could write, and understood arithmetic tolerably well, as far as the rule of three. He then asked me if I knew anything of gauging, and on my answering that I did not, he said one of his clerks should teach me to gauge. Mr. King dealt in all manner of merchandise, and kept from one to six clerks. He loaded many vessels in a year, particularly to Philadelphia where he was born, and was connected with a great mercantile house in that city. He had besides many vessels and droggers, of different sizes, which used to go about the island, and others to collect rum, sugar, and other goods. I understood pulling and managing those boats very well, 
and this hard work, which was the first that he set me to, in the sugar seasons used to be my constant employment. I have rowed the boat and slaved at the oars from one hour to sixteen in the twenty-four, during which I had fifteen pence sterling per day to live on, though sometimes only ten pence. However, this was considerably more than was allowed to other slaves that used to work with me and belong to other gentlemen on the island. Those poor souls had never more than nine pence per day and seldom more than six pence from their masters or owners, though they earned them three or four pistarines. Footnote. These pistarines are of the value of a shilling. End footnote. For it is a common practice in the West Indies for men to purchase slaves though they have no plantations themselves, in order to let them out to planters and merchants at so much apiece by the day, and they give them what allowance they choose out of this produce of their daily work to the slaves for subsistence. This allowance is often very scanty. My master often gave the owners of these slaves two and a half of these pieces per day, and found the poor fellows in victuals himself, because he thought their owners did not feed them well enough according to the work they did. The slaves used to like this very well, and as they knew my master was a man of feeling, they were always glad to work for him in preference to any other gentleman, some of whom, after they had been paid for these poor people's labours, would not give them their allowance out of it. Many times I have seen these unfortunate wretches beaten for asking for their pay, and often severely flogged by their owners, if they did not bring them their daily or weekly money exactly to the time though the poor creatures were obliged to wait on the gentlemen they had worked for, sometimes for more than half the day before they could get their pay, and this generally on Sundays, when they wanted the time for themselves. In particular, I knew a countryman of mine, who once did not bring the weekly money directly that it was earned, and though he brought it the same day to his master, yet he was staked to the ground for his pretended negligence, and who was just going to receive a hundred lashes, but for a gentleman who begged him off fifty. This poor man was very industrious, and by his frugality had saved so much money by working on shipboard that he had got a white man to buy him a boat, unknown to his master. Some time after he had this little estate, the governor wanted a boat to bring his sugar from different parts of the island, and knowing this to be a negro man's boat, he seized upon it for himself, and would not pay the owner a farthing. The man on this went to his master, and complained to him of this act of the governor, but the only satisfaction he received was to be damned very heartily by his master, who asked him how dared any of his negroes to have a boat. If the justly merited ruin of the governor's fortune could be any gratification to the poor man he had thus robbed, he was not without consolation. Extortion and rapine are poor providers, and some time after this the governor died in the king's bench in England, and I was told in great poverty the last war favoured this poor negro man, and he found some means to escape from his Christian master. He came to England, where I saw him afterwards several times. Such treatment as this often drives these miserable wretches to despair, and they run away from their masters at the hazard of their lives. Many of them, in this place, unable to get their pay when they have earned it, and fearing to be flogged as usual, if they return home without it, run away where they can for shelter and a reward is often offered to bring them in, dead or alive. My master used sometimes, in these cases, to agree with their owners, and to settle with them himself, and thereby he saved many of them a flogging. Once, for a few days, I was let out to fit a vessel, and I had no victuals allowed me by either party. At last I told my master of this treatment, and he took me away from it, in many of the estates, on the different islands where I used to be sent for rum or sugar, they would not deliver it to me, or any other negro. He was therefore obliged to send a white man along with me to those places, and then he used to pay him from six to ten pistirines a day. From being thus employed during the time I served Mr. King in going about the different estates on the island, I had all the opportunity I could wish for to see the dreadful usage of the poor men, usage that reconciled me to my situation and made me bless God for the hands into which I had fallen. I had the good fortune to please my master in every department in which he employed me, and there was scarcely any part of his business or household affairs in which I was not occasionally engaged. I often supplied the place of a clerk, 
in receiving and delivering cargoes to the ships, intending stores, and delivering goods, and besides this I used to shave and dress my master, when convenient, and take care of his horse, and when it was necessary, which was very often, I worked likewise on board of different vessels of his. By these means I became very useful to my master, and saved him, as he used to acknowledge, above a hundred pounds a year, nor did he scruple to say I was of more advantage to him than any of his clerks, though their usual wages in the West Indies are from sixty to a hundred pounds current a year. I have sometimes heard it asserted that a negro cannot earn his master, the first cost, but nothing can be further from the truth. I suppose nine-tenths of the mechanics throughout the West Indies are negro slaves, and I well know the coopers among them can earn two dollars a day, the carpenters the same, and oftentimes more, as also the masons, smiths, and fishermen, etc., and I have known many slaves whose masters would not take a thousand pounds current for them. But surely this assertion refutes itself, for if it be true, why do the planters and merchants pay such a price for a slave, and above all, why do those who make this assertion exclaim the most loudly against the abolition of the slave trade? So much are men blinded, and to such inconsistent arguments are they driven by mistaken interest. I grant, indeed, that slaves are sometimes, by half-feeding, half-clothing, overworking, and stripes, reduced so low that they are turned out as unfit for service, and left to perish in the woods, or expire on a dunghill. My master was several times offered by different gentlemen one hundred guineas for me, but he always told them that he would not sell me, to my great joy, and I used to double my diligence and care for fear of getting into the hands of those men who did not allow a valuable slave the common support of life. Many of them even used to find fault with my master for feeding his slave so well as he did, although I often went hungry, and an Englishman might think my fare very indifferent, but he used to tell them he always would do it, because the slaves thereby looked better and did more work. While I was thus employed by my master, I was often a witness to cruelties of every kind which were exercised on my unhappy fellow-slaves. I used frequently to have different cargoes of new negroes in my care for sale, and it was almost a constant practice with our clerks and other whites to commit violent depredations on the chastity of the female slaves, and these I was, though with reluctance, obliged to submit to at all times, being unable to help them. When we have had some of these slaves on board my master's vessel, to carry them to other islands, or to America, I have known our mates to commit these acts most shamefully, to the disgrace, not of Christians only, but of men. I have even known them gratify their brutal passion with females not ten years old, and these abominations some of them practised to such scandalous excess that one of our captains discharged the mate and others on that account. And yet in Montserrat I have seen a negro man staked to the ground, and cut most shockingly, and then his ears cut off bit by bit, because he had been connected with a white woman, who was a common prostitute, as if it were no crime in the whites to rob an innocent African girl of her virtue, but most heinous in a black man only to gratify a passion of nature, where the temptation was offered by one of a different colour, though the most abandoned woman of her species. Another negro man was half hanged, and then burnt, for attempting to poison a cruel overseer. Thus, by repeated cruelties, are the wretched first urged to despair, and then murdered, because they still retain so much of human nature about them as to wish to put an end to their misery and retaliate on their tyrants. These overseers are indeed for the most part persons of the worst character of any denomination of men in the West Indies. Unfortunately, many humane gentlemen, by not residing on their estates, are obliged to leave the management of them in the hands of these human butchers, who cut and mangle the slaves in a shocking manner on the most trifling occasions, and altogether treat them in every respect like brutes. They pay no regard to the situation of pregnant women, nor the least attention to the lodging of the field negroes. Their huts, which ought to be well covered, and the place dry where they take their repose, are often open sheds, built in damp places, so that, when the poor creatures return tired from the toils of the field, 
they contract many disorders from being exposed to the damp air in this uncomfortable state while they are heated and their pores are open this neglect certainly conspires with many others to cause a decrease in the births as well as in the lives of the grown negroes i can quote many instances of gentlemen who reside on their estates in the west indies and then the scene is quite changed the negroes are treated with lenity and proper care by which their lives are prolonged and their masters are profited to the honour of humanity i knew several gentlemen who managed their estates in this manner and they found that benevolence was their truest interest and among many i could mention in several of the islands i knew one in montserrat footnote mr dewberry and many others montserrat end footnote whose slaves looked remarkably well and never needed any fresh supplies of negroes and there are many other estates especially in barbados which from such judicious treatment need no fresh stock of negroes at any time i have the honour of knowing a most worthy and humane gentleman who is a native of barbados and has estates there footnote sir philip gibbs baronet barbados End footnote. this gentleman has written a treatise on the usage of his own slaves he allows them two hours for refreshment at midday and many other indulgences and comforts particularly in their lying and besides this he raises more provisions on his estate than they can destroy so that by these attentions he saves the lives of his negroes and keeps them healthy and as happy as the condition of slavery can admit i myself as shall appear in the sequel managed an estate where by those attentions the negroes were uncommonly cheerful and healthy and did more work by half than by the common mode of treatment they usually do for want therefore of such care and attention to the poor negroes and otherwise oppressed as they are it is no wonder that the decrease should require twenty thousand new negroes annually to fill up the vacant places of the dead even in barbados notwithstanding those humane exceptions which i have mentioned and others i am acquainted with which justly make it quoted as a place where slaves meet with the best treatment and need fewest recruits of any in the west indies yet this island requires a thousand negroes annually to keep up the original stock which is only eighty thousand so that the whole term of a negro's life may be said to be there but sixteen years footnote benazet's account of guinea page sixteen End footnote. and yet the climate here is in every respect the same as that from which they are taken except in being more wholesome do the british colonies decrease in this manner and yet what a prodigious difference is there between an english and a west india climate while i was in montserrat i knew a negro man named emmanuel sankey who endeavoured to escape from his miserable bondage by concealing himself on board of a london ship but fate did not favour the poor oppressed man for being discovered when the vessel was under sail he was delivered up again to his master this christian master immediately pinned the wretch down to the ground at each wrist and ankle and then took some sticks of sealing wax and lighted them and dropped it all over his back there was another master who was noted for cruelty and i believe he had not a slave but what had been cut and had pieces fairly taken out of the flesh and after they had been punished thus he used to make them get into a long wooden box or case he had for that purpose in which he shut them up during pleasure it was just about the height and breadth of a man and the poor wretches had no room when in the case to move it was very common in several of the islands particularly in st kitts for the slaves to be branded with the initial letters of their master's name and a load of heavy iron hooks hung about their necks indeed on the most trifling occasions they were loaded with chains and often instruments of torture were added the iron muzzle thumb screws etc are so well known as not to need a description and were sometimes applied for the slightest faults i have seen a negro beaten till some of his bones were broken for even letting a pot boil over is it surprising that usage like this should drive the poor creatures to despair and make them seek a refuge in death from those evils which render their lives intolerable while quote, with shuddering horror pale and eyes aghast they view their lamentable lot and find no rest End quote. this they frequently do 
a negro man on board a vessel of my master while i belonged to her having been put in irons for some trifling misdemeanour and kept in that state for some days being weary of life took an opportunity of jumping overboard into the sea however he was picked up without being drowned another whose life was also a burden to him resolved to starve himself to death and refused to eat any victuals this procured him a severe flogging and he also on the first occasion which offered jumped overboard at charlestown but was saved nor is there any greater regard shown to the little property than there is to the persons and lives of the negroes i have already related an instance or two of particular oppression out of many which i have witnessed but the following is frequent in all the islands the wretched field slaves after toiling all the day for an unfeeling owner who gives them but little victuals steal sometimes a few moments from rest or refreshment to gather some small portion of grass according as their time will admit this they commonly tie up in a parcel either a bit worth sixpence or half a bit's worth and bring it to town or to the market to sell nothing is more common than for the white people on this occasion to take the grass from them without paying for it and not only so but too often also to my knowledge our clerks and many others at the same time have committed acts of violence on the poor wretched and helpless females whom i have seen for hours standing crying to no purpose and get no redress or pay of any kind is not this one common and crying sin enough to bring down god's judgment on the islands he tells us the oppressor and the oppressed are both in his hands and if these are not the poor the broken-hearted the blind the captive the bruised which our saviour speaks of who are they one of these depredators once in saint eustatia came on board of our vessel and bought some fowls and pigs of me and a whole day after his departure with the things he returned again and wanted his money back i refused to give it and not seeing my captain on board he began the common pranks with me and swore he would even break open my chest and take my money I therefore expected, as my captain was absent, that he would be as good as his word, and he was just proceeding to strike me, when fortunately a British seaman on board, whose heart had not been debauched by a West India climate, interposed and prevented him. But had the cruel man struck me, I certainly should have defended myself at the hazard of my life, for what is life to a man thus oppressed? He went away, however, swearing, and threatened that whenever he caught me on shore he would shoot me and pay for me afterwards the small account in which the life of a negro is held in the west indies is so universally known that it might seem impertinent to quote the following extract if some people had not been hardy enough of late to assert that negroes are on the same footing in that respect as europeans by the three hundred twenty ninth act page one hundred twenty five of the assembly of barbados it is enacted quote, that if any negro or other slave under punishment by his master or his order for running away or any other crime or misdemeanour towards his said master unfortunately shall suffer in life or member no person whatsoever shall be liable to a fine but if any man shall out of wantonness or only of bloody-mindedness or cruel intention wilfully kill a negro or other slave of his own he shall pay into the public treasury fifteen pounds sterling end quote. and it is the same in most if not all of the west india islands is not this one of the many acts of the islands which call loudly for redress and do not the assembly which enacted it deserve the appellation of savages and brutes rather than of christians and men it is an act at once unmerciful unjust and unwise which for cruelty would disgrace an assembly of those who are called barbarians and for its injustice and insanity would shock the morality and common sense of a samade or a hottentot shocking as this and many more acts of the bloody west india code at first view appear how is the iniquity of it heightened when we consider to whom it may be extended mr james tobin a zealous labourer in the vineyard of slavery gives an account of a french planter of his acquaintance in the island of martinico who showed him many mulattoes working in the fields like beasts of burden and he told mr tobin that these were all the produce of his own loins and i myself have known similar instances pray reader 
are these sons and daughters of the french planter less his children by being begotten of a black woman and what must be the virtue of those legislators and the feelings of those fathers who estimate the lives of their sons however begotten at no more than fifteen pounds though they should be murdered as the act says out of wantonness and bloody-mindedness but is not the slave trade entirely a war with the heart of man and surely that which is begun by breaking down the barriers of virtue involves in its continuance destruction to every principle and buries all sentiments in ruin i have often seen slaves particularly those who were meagre in different islands put into scales and weighed and then sold from three pence to six pence or nine pence a pound my master however whose humanity was shocked at this mode used to sell such by the lump and at or after a sale it was not uncommon to see negroes taken from their wives wives taken from their husbands and children from their parents and sent off to other islands and wherever else their merciless lords chose and probably never more during life to see each other oftentimes my heart has bled at these partings when the friends of the departed have been at the water-side and with sighs and tears have kept their eyes fixed on the vessel till it went out of sight a poor creole negro i knew well who after having been often thus transported from island to island at last resided in montserrat this man used to tell me many melancholy tales of himself generally after he had done working for his master he used to employ his few leisure moments to go a-fishing when he had caught any fish his master would frequently take them from him without paying him and at other times some other white people would serve him in the same manner one day he said to me very movingly sometimes when a white man take away my fish i go to my massa and he get me my right and when my massa by strength take away my fishes what me must do i can't go to anybody to be righted then said the poor man looking up above i must look up to god mighty in the top for right this artless tale moved me much and i could not help feeling the just cause moses had in redressing his brother against the egyptian i exhorted the man to look up still to the god on the top since there was no redress below though i little thought then that i myself should more than once experience such imposition and read the same exhortation hereafter in my own transactions in the islands and that even this poor man and i should some time after suffer together in the same manner as shall be related hereafter nor was such usage of this confined to particular places or individuals for in all the different islands in which i had been and i have visited no less than fifteen the treatment of the slaves was nearly the same so nearly indeed that the history of an island or even a plantation with a few such exceptions as i have mentioned might serve for a history of the whole such a tendency has the slave trade to debauch men's minds and hardened them to every feeling of humanity. For I will not suppose that the dealers in slaves are born worse than other men. No, it is the fatality of this mistaken avarice, that it corrupts the milk of human kindness and turns into gall. And had the pursuits of those men been different, they might have been as generous, as tender-hearted and just, as they are unfeeling, rapacious and cruel. Surely this traffic cannot be good, which spreads like a pestilence and taints what it touches which violates that first natural right of mankind equality and independency and gives one man a dominion over his fellows which god could never intend for it raises the owner to a state as far above man as it depresses the slave below it and with all the presumption of human pride sets a distinction between them immeasurable in extent and endless in duration yet how mistaken is the avarice even of the planters are slaves more useful by being thus humbled to the condition of brutes than they would be if suffered to enjoy the privileges of men the freedom which diffuses health and prosperity throughout britain answers you no when you make men slaves you deprive them of half their virtue you set them in your own conduct an example of fraud rapine and cruelty and compel them to live with you in a state of war and yet you complain that they are not honest or faithful 
you stupefy them with stripes, and think it necessary to keep them in a state of ignorance, and yet you assert that they are incapable of learning, that their minds are such a barren soil or more, that culture would be lost on them, and that they come from a climate where nature, though prodigal of her bounties in a degree unknown to yourselves, has left man alone at scant and unfinished, and incapable of enjoying the treasures she has poured out of him, an assertion at once impious and absurd. Why do you use those instruments of torture? Are they fit to be applied by one rational being to another? And are ye not struck with shame and mortification to see the partakers of your nature reduced so low? But above all, are there no dangers attending this mode of treatment? Are you not hourly in dread of an insurrection? Nor would it be surprising for when, quote, no peace is given to us enslaved, but custody severe, and stripes and arbitrary punishment inflicted, what peace can we return but to our power, hostility, and hate? Untamed reluctance and revenge, though slow, yet ever plotting how the conqueror least may reap his conquest, and may least rejoice in doing what we most in suffering feel. End quote. But by changing your conduct and treating your slaves as men, every cause of fear would be banished. They would be faithful, honest, intelligent, and vigorous, and peace, prosperity, and happiness would attend you. End of chapter 5